sang yesterday that Louisa Sanano died from oh. Oh. And, uh, her sister came into the store and told us. Oh. So it, it really makes us feel like all she did, I mean, she really kept this place going and got it going. And we have a big responsibility, my family and I, to keep it going. And we love the store and we will do just that. So, oh. <laughs> and it's usually me who does that. <laughs> so, welcome. We welcome you all very much. Thank you for being here. Good evening. I'm Stephen Retiner. I'm the Poet Laureate of Arlington, Mass. But anyone in the know would tell you that Fred Marchand has been the unofficial Poet Laureate for as many years as I can remember. For some strange reason, Massachusetts uh, does not yet have its own Poet Laureate. Who can explain that? Um, but when they do, Fred would more than deserve a nomination. Not only for the consistently high level of his achievement, um, beginning with uh, his uh, first book, Tipping Point, winner of the 1993 Washington Prize, in which I'm happy to report has been re-released in a 20th anniversary issue. And then running all the way through his most recent collection, the utterly entrancing Said, Not Said from Grey Wolf. Uh, it was designated an honored book from the Massachusetts Book Awards. But also because he has devoted so much of his energy, talent, and heart to making sure that the roots of this art form remain nourished and that the growth of younger writers is able to find a sunny clearing you know, in which to thrive. Examples of his efforts, are, or his tireless efforts, are abound, but I'm just going to name a few. For many years, he was the professor of English at Suffolk University helping a new generation of young writers to discover their own creative resources, and where he became the founding director of the Poetry Center, uh, which is a wonderful site if you haven't been there, a hub for poetry readings and workshops. Fred has translated work from a number of Vietnamese poets and taught regularly at the William Joyner Center for the Study of War and Social Consequences, where poets from formal, uh, formerly rival nations often gathered, shared work, and deepened our understanding of peace. He also edited Another World Instead, the, the early poems of William Stafford, um, uh, where he was rescuing numerous selections from the poet's archive that expanded our appreciation for Stafford's already much loved body of work. But this is perhaps the highest compliment that I can pay to any poet. I don't just read Fred, I reread Fred. His books do not attract dust on my shelf. I return to the poetry of Fred Marchand most often when I'm needing a clear and, and deeply humane voice, one that comforts and surprises, especially in turbulent times like these when despair is only a phone call or a headline away. Two years ago, when I began the Red Letter Project, which sends out weekly poems throughout Massachusetts and across the country and has featured some of the uh, most impressive poets writing today, um, by the way, and some of you, since there's so many poets in the audience, something you should Google and maybe have work that you want to submit. I asked Fred if he'd allow me to use one of his poems as the very first installment, because this is what I've come to know, considering Fred as a friend and a mentor for more years than I can count. That any day I can immerse myself in Fred's poetry is certainly a red letter day. So it is my great pleasure to welcome Fred Marshall. <laughs> And am I loud enough? Yeah, you can take your mask off. Please. Okay, I think I will. Thank you, Stephen, for that <laughs> introduction. And, and I really am bowled over. 
and bowled over by the news, too. Um, so I'm going to begin, I think, by saying something about Louisa and, and, uh, and how well I remember Louisa and how many good, good things she did for poetry. When I came in the store this evening, I was telling Rebecca and Stephen that I was looking for a photograph. I don't know if it's still up there, but, but it, was, it was when Suffolk University hosted the, Internet, the Intercollegiate Poetry Festival, something that Martha Collins had organized, am I right? Um, um, and it traveled from school to school, and that was always at BC. But, but at Suffolk, the, the readings took place in the auditorium, which was at sort of down the hill, and the reception was up the hill, and it was nighttime. And so I enlisted a bunch of students um, to have flashlights and lead small groups of miners up the hill or mountain climbers up the hill. And somebody took a photograph of me with one of the flashlights. And Louisa really loved that. She thought that was really great, hilarious. And I'm standing there with a flashlight. And um, there were so many. I, I, mean, I could tell story after story. But suffice it to say that she, she gave her heart everything in her being um, to this store and to the tradition of this store from Gordon Kearney on to Vienna and all of us now are beneficiaries of, um, of that life's work. So thank you, Louisa. I used to think there was another room back here. I mean, I mean a big one. <laughs> and I used to think she used to go back and live there, but not so. Oh, but I don't want to do that. Sorry, I'm nervous. Um, <clears throat> Helena Krug was born in Lviv in 1974. She's a poet, fiction writer, a scholar of Ukrainian medieval literature. Mm -hmm. There's four books of poetry, lots of awards, and she teaches literature at Lviv. Lviv University. Mm -hmm. It's an untitled poem. Someone stands between you and death. But who knows how much more my heart can stand. Where you are, it's so important someone prays for you. Even with their own words, even if they don't clasp their hands and kneel. Plucking the stems off strawberries from the garden, I recall how I scolded you when you were small for squashing the berries before they ripened. My heart whispers, Death, he hasn't ripened yet. He's still green. Nothing in his life has been sweeter than unwashed strawberries. I beg you, Oh, God, don't place him at the front. Please, don't rain rockets down on him. Oh, God, mm -hmm. I don't even know what a rocket looks like. My son, I can't picture the war, even to myself. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm standing in the right place. There's a couple of chairs here that I'm going to sort of move up to the side so I can really make a... There. Good. Okay. A few years ago, there was a, at the Seclorama in downtown Boston, there was a wonderful installation um, by um, many people, um, light artists, drummers, um, writers. They, the writers who were invited to join in that installation were, they were asked to sort of write a poem or whatever they could write that would get, then get projected on the wall in some giant way. And uh, this was, the theme was the word no. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is a poem that came out of that strange and um, now looking back at a tremendous um, installation. So this is called Spell, to stay the hand. No, not only the word, neither fetish nor totem, not only thought, no, not even feeling, not a face or shadow, not seed on wind, no, not stop signs on fire, no, not hands held up, 
and up and up. No, not the aim you take down the long barrel. No, not the pouch. No, not the clip, nor the feet per second around will travel. No, not fires. No, not at them. There, at the, at the far end, where, no, not you, not me, not now, not again, no. Mm. This poem called, and, 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 I can't believe I was going to say it, <laughs> struggle with this word every time, and it's part of the charm of the title, anemones. Because <laughs> I always want to say enemies. <laughs> Originally, the poem was The War and Anemones. Um, and it's, it's for um, another true um, hero of poetry, George Kovac, who founded Consequence Magazine, a really important literary journal of the cultures of war and peace. Anemones. Is there anything within heart sight such as this, whose petals have begun to flare and die, whose name means daughter of the wind, whose spidery roots have outgrown a green <coughs> plastic pot that sat all winter with a flower on the edge, full-bodied, blood-red to vein blue soft. Flora delicatio, the allure and charm delicacy. Our delight in hoping to live as long as we can. A hope as delicate as what you find in a child without guile. The sort who sweetly disobeys, who romps from the shelter with a smile and out into the bombed street. Who comes home covered in chalky blast dust round face smeared into a mask under which eyes have widened and will stay that way. The kind of child we know, we all know, will sooner or later get killed easily. A child that someone will notice for a while and then forget how easy it is or was or ever shall be for a child to die. For anyone or anything to trample or rip the flower out and fling it onto a pile. For each is only just a flower, and is it not the petal's destiny to die easily, be killed quietly, to fall beautifully, as you and me, and yes, as them, the all, the rest, the those, the anemones. Again, sort of scrounging poems up for the reading and thinking I was going to do something altogether different and the presence of the warfare just kept insisting um, on this. Um, so not everything's about war, but somehow or another the things that you know are strange and personal can get refracted through that lens. This poem is called Your Last Dream. Your last dream should be a simple one where the dead stay dead. And flowers do not crowd the empty rooms, and the deep plush of the carpet does not dim what is said or change how grief feels completely at ease, having found its way home. The floor plan unchanged, allowing mourners to file into the room where you grew up, then enter, enter it with feral curiosity, holding up to candles a photo of you when you graduated from a school you did not know you had been enrolled in until it was too late, until it was morning, and sunlight had begun to reach down to the earth to find those who had disobeyed. Oh, may your last dream be kind to you and not scrape you inside out or stretch your skin out to dry on pine limbs or be made pliable by lips upon lips pressed to your cheek, while everywhere the tall, 
glads, mingled with pale roses, upright in lavish sprays with open petals, saying, sorry, so very sorry. so nice of Stephen to mention William Stafford in that, of course, that book, but, but William Stafford was both a friend, a teacher, um, and, and over the years I grew to be friends with his son, Kim Stafford, who himself is a really fine poet, essayist, teacher, and um, Kim, uh, po twice poet laureate of Oregon. And um, this, so this poem is for Kim Stafford. It's called The Peace Shelf. peace shelf. At last light, you asked, what books would we stock it with? But we knew peace did not like the idea of shelf life, or even being on the shelf. Too linear, it would have said, and too tame, because peace itself was more <laughs> wild than not, more animal in hiding, wide-eyed, alert, just beyond the dying coals we leaned into, trying to imagine what it was, how some of our words might hide the sound of leaves it stepped on, while it studied us, wondering what creatures we were, how we foraged what we needed, and asking ourselves if it approached blinking and uncertain, would we despise it and ourselves so much that we would rip it to pieces and move on. Pilgrim Spring, you, many of you have driven up Route 6 to Ward Provincetown, and on the right-hand side is one of the national seashore places where the pilgrims um, stopped and you know, looked for fresh water. Pilgrim Spring. It's not where you think it is. It's not even where the map says it should be. <laughs> but you've been here many times before. You still don't know where it is. You walk down gravel winter paths and listen to a scrub oak talking dead talk with frozen leaves and seagrass. The icy winter dunes and an end of day skies while a small hiding creature stirs as you pass and you think it just might guide you to the place where you can kneel and sip trying to take in what the spring offers. The broken limbs, the lost lives reaching up from under the frozen ground, and the history, our history, hidden in sweet water, welling up somewhere around here, out on the farthest edge of who we, as a nation and a people, are. I've been very fortunate to, um, to be a part of a veterans writing group out in the Bay Area. It was founded by Maxine Hong Kingston back in 1993. Writing groups don't last long, mm -hmm. you know? And it really, is a, it, it's, its conception was always um, for veterans um, and their significant others um, to be part of it and to, you know, have the writing. It was structured around meditational practices and, and have the writing and the consciousness um, touch the things that were so unbearable. Um, so this is a reflection after after one of those sessions, mm -hmm. sitting around the backyard of Maxine and Earl Kingston, for them, the Buddha of the garden table. Especially now, in the worst of it, I feel my mind pull away from the clank, the clatter, from worries about health, money, and the jets overhead, from the angry sound of a car taking off its driver, burning rubber at the stop sign. What rises to mind instead is a memory of mists in the morning, seeping water, good soil that feeds the bougainvillea, sweet fern and fennel in your backyard a continent away. That, that in the memory of the glass Buddha, its gray translucent face watching over us, sitting at the round rickety wooden table, telling stories, true ones, we said, of suffering and hope. 
how deeply a war gets etched within. How the heart recoils but will not forget. How it seizes up and begins to die. How we help each other to bring it back. <clears throat> Here's a strange irony for you. This is National Poetry Month. It's also Parkinson's Awareness Month. <laughs> Go figure. There are 10 million people plus in the world with Parkinson's disease, 1.2 million in this country. And um, um, it's touched my family um, closely. And, and it's always hard to imagine things like you know, serious chronic illness. But when, when, they, when they touch you, you can't stop imagining. Or at least, anyway, this is an imagined moment in the middle of the night. Viscera. I cried out. I was in such fear, I made a rough sign of the cross. Forehead, breast, shoulders, I couldn't help myself. Call me an infant. It was the infant's hour and I couldn't see. Or saw only the empty room and knew it would only get worse at the, as the illness ripped at our lives. And I knew too well to think of God, any God would save us or even one of us. As I went down my list, the God of no gods, the God of never there and wouldn't go there, the God in disguise who liked to go ta-da before saving anyone. <laughs> How my mind raced through each and each thought of prayer and words becoming just air from lungs that would only take in more air, bringing it to the innards of a body that just did not care, and leading it up to a mind that kept looping its reel of what the old king said to his daughter, how from nothing comes nothing. The scene at night, a granite throne room, large, empty, barely lit, a rough cut floor, hard on the knees of the faithful. Very brand new poem, and it's so brand it's hiding. <laughs> Damn it. We'll, just, we'll go on with that. Let me read two more poems. Lilac. Not the tree per se. Not the tree per se. Not the blossom. The scent already gone, but its bark. The limbs entwined, how they glow in late sunlight, are wholly present, wholly present to the light they meet only now, these long neglected stems which we naturally call wooden. They, <clears throat> they are bringing the light into themselves so deeply they look like an idea of lilac forming or desire stirring upward, entwined. They look like what in this world love is. Just above that lilac bush, one night last summer, I happened to turn my head at, this, at a sound and saw not, <laughs> actually my wife said to me, did you take that for her? Well, uh, no. <laughs> but it, but this is a this is a soft wet owl. A soft wet owl is about that big, mm. and it is. Turns out I didn't know this till I looked it up. It is common enough in the northeast and across the northern swath of the country, actually. Mm. And um, <laughs> and on the edge of my garage in a crappy gutter, there was a soft wet owl looking at me, <laughs> and and then it went. Took one of the one of the wings way, you know, and I heard that sound, and then it left. Saw wet, oh the w h e t is the word, and it's and the name of the owl supposedly comes from the sound of its call, which is the they say like the sound of a saw being sharpened with a wet stone.
So will. You could barely hear it. And when you looked over your shoulder to the roof, tracking the feathery sound you saw first, a small head and banded body, then the wings that flared, and you could almost see it say to itself, landing here was a mid-ruffle mistake. <laughs> While you, the old inveterate meaning maker, are already thinking, here is the sound death when it comes will make. The sigh of someone who has arrived at your door after traveling all night is glad you are home. It wants to shake off the dust and get a good look at you to be sure you're the one. <laughs> or is this palava about dying only the easy eeriness of a poem on a humid summer night? One ripe with ghosts and memory. Maybe this visitor is more like a word that breaks the surface. And has come to name the mix of contraries in every feeling. Or maybe it is like an image that wonders how it came to take up residence in you. Or perhaps it is a sound barely heard, but real enough for you to know that whatever else it might mean, this is how the next poem might begin. The feather breath of what is small, secretive, and near. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. to hear you read, um, and as usual, to hear you read new poems, at least new to me. Now, <clears throat> we're turning to a whole new book. Brand new, cut off the press, gorgeous outside, and <laughs> in, Rebecca Kaiser Gibson's Girl as Birch. This isn't exactly the book's launch. That happened in New Hampshire, where Rebecca now lives. But this is her Massachusetts launch, which is important not only because we're here, but also because Rebecca lived here for much of her adult life, first working in theater, then teaching at Tufts University for 23 years. <clears throat> it was here, too, that I first encountered her when she reviewed one of my books for the Boston Book Review. Hers was one of the smartest reviews I'd ever received, and I knew I had to get to know her. She must, I thought, be quite some poet. And so she was, and so she is. Rebecca began publishing poems in the 1990s, published a couple of chapbooks in 2006, and in 2015 brought out her first full-length collection, Open Now, which was widely and well received. She was awarded a Mass Cultural Council grant in 2009 and a year-long Fulbright Fellowship to India a year after that. She was a generous member of our Boston area poetry community and continues to serve in that capacity in New Hampshire, where she founded and directs the Loom Poetry Reading Series. And, I should add, where she continues to be a marvelously productive writer. Her first novel, The Promise of a, no of a Normal Life, will be published in February. But tonight, we're honored to welcome this second book of poems which is an exquisite rendering of the more than normal life of a girl, or rather, a girl. She, in the first part of the book, just born young. I, later, through adolescence and into adulthood, often we, and still later, into the years when death becomes a presence. But as the shifting pronouns in the title suggest, this is no mere autobiography. From the beginning, the speaker is deeply embedded in the natural world, 
both as keen observer and as co-inhabitant. Girl is birch, baby is lighted and azalea, she becomes bog draping granite. Birds sing and flutter throughout and snakes appear. Flowers are abundant in gardens, all of it suggesting beauty and connection, but also danger and constraint. One poem begins, if she stayed walled in gardens, well, she didn't in the Zodiacus book. Explicit myth, like the implicit Eden, expands the scope of the book. More subtly, music takes us more deeply in. A speaker in one poem refers to my own melodic legs, and the music of the poems themselves makes reading a physical as well as an aesthetic pleasure. Listen to some of the sounds of the opening poem. Girl as perch, pretending, compliant, pliant, ancient lenience. And then a realignment, silent wind, liminal, resilient as a branch. Girl as perch, girl as perch as music. Please give Rebecca and her wonderful new book a warm welcome. Mm -hmm. I had this whole plan of what I was going to read. You can see all these little pieces of paper. And I just got in, um, inspired by Fred kind of deciding what he was reading as we went. Are you okay for hearing me? Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to do that. But this one is called Keep That Band-Aid On. <laughs> the floor of the pool painted white, cracked, stubs, toes. Do not pick at your scabs or scratch your poison ivy or pull out single strands of hair. I was not to eat food from the stand, no chocolate cones, no bubble gum, and wear a swim cap down my forehead. The skin creased like a rose. Mm. You remember those white, uh, <laughs> horrible swim caps? <laughs> um, Girl is Birch is kind of organized around, I mean, by the first poem. So I'm going to read that again. Martha read parts of it. Um, and I really had not looked at Birch's until I moved to New Hampshire and realized that they do, in fact, bend in the, in the wind. Or in Robert Frost's poems, when boys climb on them and make them go down. <laughs> but they also rise up. I couldn't believe it, watching storms out the window, that such a huge thing could be affected by wind and that it could then recover. I mean, I can't even believe it when daffodils do that. <laughs> Why don't they just collapse? <laughs> it's so neat. And I thought, finally, after, when I was, uh, it took me a long time to think of myself as a girl. We weren't allowed to use that word. It was kind of not what feminists were supposed to say. And then I realized, wait, um, girl as birch, pretending, compliance, compliant, ancient lenience. According to a faulty credo, any agile gesture equals allure. Mm. Then when wind abates, stature regained, a realignment, silent limbed, Liminal, resilient as a branch pushed from the path and springing back. Mm -hmm. um, so unlike my original plan, the next poem is Silent Limbed. It's in several sections. One, relentless honeysuckle, thin-legged multitudes of fern, 
thorny raspberry cane taking over, innocuous goldenrod, all wilt by fall, slack collapsed. Over moonlit snow fields, only shadow tree limbs sprawl, leafless, swaying with emaciated weight to shift the stark, blank, ceaseless. Two. This is pre-birth, number two is. Still in limbo, known only in the space she took and nascent kicks, maybe she crouched, or did she nudge the rim? No lace, nor cinched waist, yet she would emerge, a red cloud, lifted by Minerva, whose dark wing would sweep her up through rock cleft, her sudden self shifted from liquid hours, throat, a sparrow. Sorry, I should have told you this ahead of number three, but um, this number three is um, based on the Picasso painting, Acrobat and a Young, uh, I can't remember the title of it, but it, um, there's a man facing backwards and a young, I think, girl, maybe, who knows, on a ball, balancing. In his hefty prime, a man brooded, self-absorbed, drained of motion, broad ass dull on bone-colored box. Massive thighs spread, thick neck, a spinal cord snaking up his shaved small head as out of his knee, not out of his rib or even his head, a girl grew a study in contrast, balancing on a ball, arms aloft, open, as if easy to adore, even in the glowering of history, even though his backward-facing bloom forced her life demure blue. Four. Her mother wrapped her in rough flannel, sterilized against real and imagined disease, aching more, I think, than she in her extremity, still cocooned. In June, the 17-year cicadas came, their blue, green, beige translucence, a glimmering goneness. No clapping, no clinking, not even that pause of preparation, nor resonant afterthought, nor orchestral restraint, post-drum roll reluctance. She gathered glossy shells, empty of a larger life. Uh, um, I, so. <laughs> I do want to read about gardens. I hadn't realized you had so many flowers in your poems <laughs> until lately. <laughs> about gardens. If she'd stayed, walled in gardens, blushing poppies, shaded in foxglove, scaled by long-leaved clematis, all that after before her. She'd have kept a visible shape, reading the summer years. Inside garden walls, she knew early motion, winds that sway, stalks that bend, and rise and rise uncanny and exact. Had she, inside, found her way by coxcomb, flocks and daisies, turquoise skies, her feet in dirt and stood, she'd have known where she'd be home, and known in, gra in mounded ground, swaths of luscious green and splash, a repetition of each hue in herself, a young girl, straw-hatted, hoping for the right someday to be where laughter is, Voices sharp as green grapes, skin transparent veils. Um, now I'm shipping the poems I meant to read. By the way, uh, Steffi, if you can see me, I. <laughs> um, this poem called um, Untaught I Knew is based on the Chagall picture, I in the Village, and the picture has this man, or I guess man with a green face, and the goat, the white goat facing it, 
and then these upside down uh, village, sort of medieval village, and, a, and some people walking up. And my father gave me the painting. I don't know how he knew how much I love Chagall, because I don't think I told him. I wanted to also say, by the way, that the, the girl in this book, until the end, is very quiet. She doesn't speak. She doesn't talk to people. She takes stuff in, but she doesn't speak. Untaught, I knew, in silence, spoke a red blaze to the green man, unmoving and dark as a forest pool. My goat muzzle, red lined against unsaid words, each face half a valentine, a saturated past, the nod that untaught I'd known, sacred slant and tilt. If I follow the angled path, my creature self will share the slope, a thin line tight, an indigo eye to a pearl mouth. If you look very closely at that painting, you will see there really are very thin lines. <laughs> um, the yoga teacher at my feet draws a line between my smallest toe and my unknown. Twigs entwine behind thin skin. She presses my big toe to trust the earth. If I lift my ankle, you can try this, if I lift my ankle, just the inner, weight my little toe, let the large take root. Breath might flutter up my trunk. This poem, is, the next poem, is called Miniature Rajasthani Bells. Rajasthani painting is very um, precise, uh, tiny things. Do you all know, do you know Rajasthani painting? Oh, it's from Rajasthan. <laughs> um, anyway, these bells were hanging on a Christmas tree. And all the other objects here are uh, objects on a Christmas tree. And I wrote it for Simone, my granddaughter, three months before she was born. And uh, the idea behind it, which I didn't realize until long after I wrote it, was that the objects on the Christmas tree, they're a little, um, I know I'm misusing this word, but they're like metonymies for the world. Like the, they just represent something, but they represent, they exist themselves, but they represent the, the quote, real thing. And I thought that's exactly what art does, too. Anyway, miniature Rajasthani bells dangling on slender threads with painted gold leaf haltered steeds, each hoof a single stranded stroke of luck, each bell a call to prayer. Menageries of inference, your finger, glossy cut out frogs in knee high rubber boots, uh, paper, sorry, boots, paper fishing gear, a net, Raffia lions, lighter than matchbooks, tails perpetually aloft. When you touch them, notice, hold, inhale their musk. There's a lot of um, gardens, snakes, and mirrors in this book, <laughs> not surprisingly. <coughs> this one is called Girl in the Mirror. One, three sections. Did I finally, for an instant, leave it? Leave it? Two. Had I always been placed to please, shoulders tight, my hands in every photo held carefully, one nestled as a teacup in the other, neck upright, a stalk, no, a swan, head turned ever so vaguely away, never direct nor uncalculated for effect, left arm lowered to lap right asymmetrical, my gestures adjusting to repeat, reflect, repeat, deflect in mirrors. Gazing, 
rather snitching glances in bistros, car windows, ponds, spoons, glazed by daily artifice, always stylish, a mannequin in cantilevered cowboy boots stitched with butterflies, long skirt, shoulder padded jacket, wide belt, hair angled, see me, please, see me. Eyes on me, all oh, eyes, especially my own, imagining eyes, imagining. Three. Until that sighting, unplanned, in dark glass at the train station, hair untamed, uncontainable me, too shiny in black raincoat, untended in drizzle, the frizzy spikes of hair jagged, my too black coat with its inside reversible flutter of flowerettes in green and purple, too sugary, worse even than the unremitting shadow, myself projected that anyone might see, lonely, empty, English side street. Nudged. How are you doing? Okay, yes. Nudged. <laughs> Since I'm breathing today, why not notice how absorbing the stamina of mullein, pulsing, salubrious, yellow, upright. And in spite of not witnessing on purpose, I am witness to quivering diversity. No space, not clovers or wild winking, like reminding, with its disinterest, which forgotten seems not forgetting, but revealing after all. Again, I am breathing. A tumbled spore of earth and siphoned starlight commingling. I also have two more poems. Um, this one is about my friend Lilla, who um, died suddenly a few years ago. Um, well, she fell. She just fell down some stairs. And uh, there's a reference to Arjuna from the Mahabharata, who I only know a little bit about him, but what I know is he was an archer, and he, and he, he was invincible until he decided it was time for him to die as a result of various things. But anyway, he decided. So there's that. And this takes place on um, the beginning part of it, on Mount Auburn Avenue. I was parked, uh, this is about me, I was parked facing Harvard Square, and I was going to do a U-turn to go back to New Hampshire. Lella, once, one. Then yesterday, comma, comma, my blue car, backing quietly, its front eyes on oncoming traffic, prepared to swerve between the headlight, earnest, homebound, no, shot out of hell, away from bound cars. My blue car, hunching its willing back, ready to pounce on fleeting time to execute a swift U-turn, heard a clunk. Out the side view mirror, as we swung, I saw we tapped a motorcycle parked at our hind end. The cycle toppled, so I stopped, floated, disembodied back across the street. Though I hadn't thought to cross, I'd crossed to find the cycle spewing gas over its offended, fallen midriff, its metal middle sideways its skinny right hand handlebar jammed into the spreading gas. I tried in vain to haul it up, my hands reeking of gas and pity, my throat parched. I howled at passing cars. Two. When Lilla died last week, she tripped, collapsed, or simply tumbled down a flight of stairs no one knew. But Lilla knew when it was time. Arjuna chose to let the arrow enter. She knew her belly laugh with me, belittled shibboleths. We chortled, gobbled molten chocolate cake and glee. With unrelinquished certitude, she'd stood on honor. All assured, she rarely stalled. 
when hobbled, lurched ahead, powered by her, uh, my, by her motored purr, her unalloyed metallic nerve. Now, how would I? Three, trust. Some women paint even their lampshades white to persevere, excuse me, to preserve unchanged as springtime blooming violets. Some, our cells suspended, ignoring gravity, beg favors of the spine inside, white as a, as a paper birch, to arise again from drooping. The weightlessness we fear, we crave. The bodies lurch, the plummet and the catapult alike. Four evenings, we recover in moist clumps of laughter to beneath even my dainty two-year-old, waking drowsy in the afternoon, clicking bow-shaped barrettes everywhere in my messy hair, and her son's ferocious rivalry urgently alive. On her pine casket now, froths of white roses, white anemones, red-stained manzanita limbs. She'd have liked it, that calm, long gone, our cake, our hooting relief at the day, done. The kids have forgiven each other, have forgiven us. Five, they're sending me her gold earrings, so I hear her by means of, I imagine her approving, though I've changed, silver, I'm alive, as opposed to that white-bellied deer alive and leaping, then not. Still, the earrings will sway, catch light, reflect her strategies to enhance. So I hear her, the soprano thrill of her aplomb, the highest part encompassing the melody, noting in shapely golden voice her clarity, uncontested. Who would defy her might inside the laughter, hear no hesitation? Here she meant, take me entire. Now, is it better to say I lied, it's more than two, or just to do two? Um, I have to choose the former. My friend's daughter-in-law needs to ask me, no, to tell me her side now that Lilla's gone. At almost closing time, her eyes, urgent sapphires, have endured too long the drought her husband's rebuff of Lilla's confidence, tacking to each new opportunity, oblivious of severed rootedness. He opted for the opposite, rugged he'd seem to her, a saguaro, simply male, unmovable. Neither would relent, and she, his bride, a vine, trying to entwine, had twisted herself, she tells me. <coughs> Marine Recipe is the last poem I'm reading and the last poem in the book. <laughs> You'd like it if I end with salt, right? Breathing oceans and olives brine as it slides along the tongue. Fear just right under the surface where the world's order upends. Swirls overhead in fervent arcs and water is chaotic and unkempt. I'm afraid of ending in, of ending in upendedness. Add patience, a dollop thick, and no sharp shells or gritty undertow, a sheath over panic. Look at you, for instance, having surfaced so proudly, your prow bobbling on gentle cellos of fame, swooning, I imagine. I'm not being fair. What remains if we add water in quantity, starlight in excess, the unexpected tanager, the ardent firefly, the daily hungers, the content of continuity? Thank you. <laughs>
We have some books for sale. The poets will be signing books. If everyone can help move the chairs up against the wall, I would be grateful. Thank you for coming. Thank you.